Certification, Development Certification Services Company, but you know all about that. We're here to learn about failure today, not about our company. So our agenda for the day is to first have a quick introduction on Effusion, how we've learned how to avoid failures, and then a quick few minutes on the aviation development overview. What are safety, systems, aircraft, software, hardware standards? What's the basis? What's a quick overview? And how can we use that to avoid failure? And then we'll discuss the specific ecosystem of software 178, hardware 254, aircraft and systems 4754, and then finally safety with ARP 4761. Then we'll go into the top failures and how to prevent, and then conclusion, where to get additional information, and most of it's free. We'll show you where that is. And then we'll have a time for probably five or six questions, hopefully. Let's take a look. First, let's have a little quiz. You know how these work. We like our quizzes. These are true, false. So 178C, 254, 47, 54, 61 are optional for civil aviation. Is that true or false? We'll talk about military also. Number two. DO and ARP provide clear instructions for engineering processes. I think you know the answer to that one. Number three, guidelines such as 475461 are not commonly applied to military today. Number four, testing is used to directly improve aircraft and system quality, true or false. And number five, process assurance also called quality assurance in the case of software, data, uh, CNS, ATM, performs detailed reviews and tests. Do QA people do that? True or false? Well, again, answers coming up. Let's take a look real quick, a little bit about Effusion. We're one of the world's largest, actually we are the world's largest pure aviation certification mentoring training. We only work in aviation. We've got 50 engineers on site, off site, they're all rather senior, another way to say old, like me, but lots of experience. The average is about 20 to 25 years experience. Our focus is on doing work like you, but at a senior level for shorter term. We provide mentoring, training, augmentation. We also have templates and checklists and standards for all of these aviation ecosystem items, including 54, 61, 178, 254, et cetera. And we've worked for 90% of the world's top 100 Asian aviation development companies. And I think I recognize quite a few names on our attendee list. And you know me, I've got a few degrees in engineering and I was the founder of three of the world's largest avionics and aviation development uh, services company. I've actually trained about 22,000 people, which interestingly is more than all the other instructors in the world combined. And we've worked on many, many different projects and papers. If you need more information, just hit our website or send us an email. Now, let's dive in. How to not fail in aviation development and certification. It's what we're all here for today. Remember, the aviation ecosystem. Most of us work in just one of these areas, but for us, it's all of them. First, in the, your upper left, it's the safety assessment. That's ARP 4761, but it's the new version coming out this year, 61A. Think of the A as being a little more aircraft centric. That's not what it means, it means the next version, but A for aircraft, a little more cohesiveness and coordination across the systems within the aircraft. That safety assessment determines the architecture, the criticality level or development assurance level, also called the design assurance level, proper word development assurance level, or just call it the DAO. That feeds into the system development, 4754. We're gonna discuss the eight plans. I'm holding up eight fingers. There's eight plans for system development. Then, and then after, we have the software, 178 hardware, 254. But look at that little AMC 2152A. We're gonna discuss that because to not understand AMC 2152A is a true way to fail. Now remember, we made some changes. See these red lines? That's right, you like that? Yeah. Well, 
those red lines that we see here, these are the feedback loops. Previously, we didn't have those feedback loops mandatory. They were optional. Optional is like telling your children to eat their vegetables, but it's optional. Not many vegetables being eaten. Well, it's no longer optional. We have to show that safety, systems, hardware, software were continuously involved at, with feedback loops. And again, in aviation, if we can't prove it, we didn't do it. So we need proof of reviews, checklists, participation continuously for the safety assessment. Then, after we've defined our safety environment, our system environment, including the aircraft, software, hardware, then we remember there's three integral processes. We cover all this in our training. If you can't come to our training, just download the free white papers on our website. They describe all this. One of my D0178 first books has it also. You can find that on Amazon. But the planning process comes first. And planning is red. It's important. Left to right. So planning comes first. That means your plans for certification, development, quality assurance or process assurance, configuration management, verification and validation, but software doesn't have validation. Those come first with the standards. Then the development process. That's not the implementation. It's the development. Development is requirements, including safety. Remember the previous slide. Then it's the detail requirements, then the design, then the implementation, then the integration. All of that is a development. It must follow planning. In the background, we've got the integral processes. Those are continuous throughout the project. Integral processes. Why are they green? Well, I'll answer that. Integral processes are the reviews, the configuration management, the process and quality assurance, the verification for everything, validation for system and hardware and safety. And that's continuous with the certification. Why is that green? Easy. I'm broadcasting here from one of a Fusion's offices in America. And as you know, in America, our money is green. That's right. We made that slide green, that integral process box green, because that's the most expensive process of all. Truly, if we don't understand how to reduce and manage the cost of the integral processes, we will fail, not technically, but financially. Okay, let's continue. The last slide before we discuss the actual failure conditions. Remember, we have these nine key attributes for 178, 254, 4754. First, detailed planning. We have to have approved plans before we design. It's five plans for software, five plans for hardware, and eight planning topics. We don't care how many documents you have, it's eight planning topics for systems and aircraft. There's five criticality levels. Now, English is a funny language. You're listening to this, so you speak English. In English, we have many words for the same thing. Criticality level, criticality level, development assurance level, design assurance level, DAO. They all mean the same thing, truly, okay? Which one should you use? Pick one. You want to be safe? Call it the DAO. You want to be most accurate? It's development assurance level. We've evolved over time. Our processes and our product must be consistent and deterministic for that criticality level. The criticality level is based upon a formal safety assessment, formal because it follows 4761, 4754, and determines what the failure condition is, what's the failure effect, the worst case. Then traceability, top to bottom, safety requirements to system requirements, to hardware, software, to implementation, and bottom to top. So it's top to bottom, bottom to top, bottom to top. Are all the implementation elements there for a reason? The reason is you have requirements. Then engineering independence, we'll talk about this. Engineering independence, a different person verifying and validating from the person who created. So we have a minimum three people on a project, QA, PA, then the creator, then the verifier validator. 
We need independence among all those three. Now, path testing. If people can be injured by software or killed by hardware, then we need to prove that the logic decisions of the software hardware engineers were correct. Well, that's done by path testing. Number seven, proven tools. We have qualification. If the tool's output will be trusted, remember, who do we trust in aviation? No one. Definitely not you and me, the aviation engineers. So if we're gonna trust the tool, that means we don't have to review the outputs. That means we must qualify it. Number eight, there's up to 20 artifact types. And for software 178, there's 71 objectives. Number nine, we're guilty until proven innocent. So in the last four minutes, we've had a quick overview, all too quick. If you need more detail, download our free white papers at effusion.com. But let's now look at the actual failures. You probably recognize this. That's right, Tenerife, the airline's senior most flight instructor, the senior most pilot. When he can die, we all can. Now, that's what we're here for, to prevent these failures. Number one, the top failure is neglecting independence. Now remember, independence, it's about the integral process, okay? Quality assurance and verification. But let's look. There's actually two kinds of independence. Ice cream has two flavors, strawberry and chocolate. They're related, but they don't look the same. Same with functional independence here. Let's look. Using different functional requirements to implement an aircraft or system level aspect, right? For example, deceleration. It could be performed by wheel brakes, but also thrust reversers, ground spoilers, they're independent. I can control direction on the ground by rudder if I'm going a high speed, 80 to 100 miles an hour. That's a 120, 160 knots for you non-American uh, standard folks. Nose wheel steering, differential braking. I can control the aircraft in the air with flight control surfaces, vector thrust. Those are different. They're independent. I can provide the relative aircraft position, communication, navigation. Navigation itself can be done by global positioning system satellites. I have an IRS, an inertial reference system with a IMU. I can provide angle of attack. Oh yeah, that's our recent news the last year, right? I can have vane or synthetic AOA that I could compute from airspeed and the inertial data. And finally, fuel quantity. I can have an engine flow rate, tank fuel probes. These are independent, okay? However, item development independence is a different type of independence. Item development independence is using different items that will minimize the probability of a common mode failure. Think, I have primary flight control, backup flight control. I put them in one conduit, one tube, single point failure, that violates independence. John is testing Mary's GPS software. Mary wrote the GPS simulator. John uses Mary's GPS simulator to test Mary's GPS software. John is independent, but he's not. The process isn't. He has single point failure, the simulator for Mary. Different technologies, such as using hydraulic or electrical power, that's item independence. A different operating system. There's 14 RTOSs, real-time operating system, that have been commercially certified, meaning you can buy the artifacts for aviation avionics. Well, there's only nine available today. Using different ones would be item independence. Then using different computers, different software languages. Be careful with that. You dilute the team and you introduce complexity with a strained team. Using different microprocessors, a separate monitor different teams and processes. Those are item development independence. But a very common failure mode is this. Think, what's the minimum number of people required for developing a level B project? Okay, ah, you got it. If you include the DER CVR, uh, CVE, which is a little optional in USA, designated engineering representative, Canada, Europe, quite often South America, compliance verification engineer. 
Well, it's for people. Who's the most important? Really, QA, quality assurance, or we call it process assurance for hardware and systems. But then a doer and a verifier. The doer does safety, requirements, design, implementation, testing. The verifier assesses to plans and standards the doer. So they verify requirements, design, code, tests. Now, with independence, the top failures we see, and we do a lot of audits. Each month we're auditing six or eight different companies. We don't talk about our clients, but remember, as the criticality level increases, so does the independence. You have to prove that everything was independently verified and QA, PA doesn't do reviews. Oh yes, they do, but we don't call it reviews. It's audits. Reviews are technical. Audits are process oriented. Audits are a sample. So if you don't have the required independence, then you have development rework potential, okay? Now, remember, criticality levels are like taxes. Taxes usually only go up. Now, I'm not saying Texas, you know, or 50th state in America, I'm saying taxes. So taxes go up because we want more from the government to provide those services. Well, in aviation, the criticality level is a tax on your development. That's right, more work, more independence, more activities. So if you have a level C project, that means no one can die from a failure, and it becomes a level B, because you automate something, Airbus, you minimize the redundancy, military. That means the criticality level through the FHA would likely go up, functional hazard assessment, followed by the preliminary aircraft safety assessment and the preliminary system safety assessment on the architecture. Likely, the criticality level goes up. If you don't have the required independence, then you have to start over, okay? Don't do that. So a recommendation to avoid that failure. Even when independence isn't required, do it. It provides a better review against future criticality level increases, okay? Now, the next failure, plans, standards, checklists. Hmm, there's too much documentation in aviation, right? Well, no one can disagree. But remember, the documentation is not for you, the doer, truly. The documentation is for the person verifying, the person following. Most of you are not working on all new aviation projects. Most of us are updating some type of product that existed before. We don't have the author's original knowledge. The documentation is for the verifier, the QAPA, and the people, the engineers, that's you, who follow. So think about this. When we have plans that aren't compliant to DO fully, DO is not a buffet. We don't pick and choose. All of it has to be there. When we are done with our plans and standards, when they've been approved, we should never, never have to look at DO or ARP again, truly. If we find ourselves looking at DO ARP, there's only one conclusion. When we're auditing from a fusion, we realize, oh goodness, there's not enough detail in those engineers' plans and standards. Now, lack of checklists. Checklists are your receipt. Think about this. You've all been on business trips. When you go on a business trip, you have to have rules, receipts. If you spend $500 on dinner, probably you violate your company's expense report standard. If you don't have a receipt, you paid cash, lost the receipt, you don't get reimbursed. That's a simple case. Aviation's the same. We have standards that we have to show we followed, and the receipt, our checklist, is the proof of that. So we have to show that the independent review really was done. QA checks the transition criteria. We'll talk about that in another failure. The plans and standards need to be complete before we start the project. They have to be approved. They have to be approved and signed by QAPA, but QAPA doesn't really develop them, okay? They delegate, but they're responsible. By having QAPA sign off or approve, 
those plans and standards. That means QAPA is able to understand and audit. Plans and standards need to also be approved by the Certification Authority, EASA, FAA, Transport Canada, CASA, the military. But remember, no one wants to read a 300-page plan. Every two months, we get a 300-page plan submitted to us, and it has too much detail. It's a recipe. The plans say what you do, what the criteria are, not all the detail of how. When it has too much detail, they require extreme customization for each project. They should be largely cut and paste. So if you're interested in a free sample of a plan or standard checklist, just send an email to us. We'll send you a sample. We have many companies in the world using our plans and standards. Now, what's required for level A, B, and C software under 178? These are the documents. Yes, it's a big list of documents. Which ones can we skip? None of them. The level of rigor varies based on the criticality level. However, if we look here, and we'll make these slides available to you, okay? You'll have the video recording. We'll send it out usually within 24 days. But there are five plans, okay? Certification, development, QA, CM, BNB. Then there's standards. The standards say how you clarify the subjective elements of requirements, design, and code. Then you have the actual code, design documents, requirements, the test cases, the test results, the configuration index, problem reports, QA, CM, tool qual. All of these are required. Remember, especially for the people who follow. Now, the next failure, hardware related. We're really seeing this failure especially in Europe, where, to be frank, EASA has a rather high bar, higher than many people think the FAA has for hardware. Now, there's some reasons for that. We won't go into that here. There's some interesting politics, but we're a technical company. And AMC, remember, advisory circular. It's AMC, the new version, version A2152, is the international clarification to DO254. To update these guidelines, 4754, 178254, takes a lot of work. So it takes years. Instead, we codify, we clarify the rules by having ACs. Divergence is a natural condition. We want convergence between Europe, South America, Embraer, USA. So AMC 2152 is the latest update. It's not available yet. It's almost approved. It should be available in just two to three months and then mandatory this year. What does it contain? Well, here we go. This is the key change areas within DO254 over in Europe. You call it ED80, European document. DO means US document. But first, DAL-D and circuit card assemblies, circuit card assemblies, LRU, COTS. There's no 254 required because a total failure causes no major injury or death. And you already have the ARP 4754, that's ED79 over in Europe. You already have the system requirements, the black and white requirements, requirement reviews, test, review of test and configuration. Since you already have that, it equates to DO254, but only for level D. Now, commercial off-the-shelf hardware. This is simplified. We won't have white box. White box, you look inside. We'll, ha we'll have black box. That's where we test from the outside. However, many people were failing because they did not have a complete function definition. They didn't have thorough tests of that functional definition that the COTS replicated, and they did not know exactly what version from Intel, Altair. Remember, many of you use Microsoft Windows, Android, iOS. Those don't ever change, do they? Oh, how about every week, at least month? We have to know which version we're running. My cell phone here, which version of iOS is it? Well, that matters in aviation. So 
we have to have strong configuration management to know exactly what version is there. It's the 30-year rule. Can we replicate it for 30 years? Now, commercial off-the-shelf intellectual property, IP. For decades, we've been using IP from software. You use compiler libraries, math libraries, device drivers, graphics, okay? Well, in hardware, as hardware becomes more important, and hardware is silicon. Hardware, you can touch it, it has weight. Software, it's like the words in a book. The printing is the hardware. The meaning is the software. COTS IP is really pre prevalent for hardware. It's really growing, especially FPGAs. Now, there's some special rules for COTS IP. With AMC 2152A, we will fail if we don't do these three things on this line. First, supplier selection assessment. You have to have a defined process for how you select suppliers and assess their quality. Then you need planning, detailed and derived requirements. Remember, derived requirements. They're derived from a safety assessment or to fill a gap in an engineer's implementation. They're not derived from a parent functional requirement. They're derived from the engineer, so they require safety involvement. We have to have that for the COTS IP. Then integration and V and V. Now, if it's level A and B, that means white box, data flow, control flow, low level requirements, functional tests, robustness tests, structural coverage tests, or what we call element analysis, since it also applies to circuits. So even though it's off the shelf, we can't trust it completely. You know we don't use Microsoft Windows in the cockpit for critical functions. The new Windows is a very good operating system, but we can't assess white box, what's inside. Same with COTS IP with hardware. It's produced by somebody who's not necessarily a strong aviation quality person. So we have to have that integration V and V. Finally, AMC 2152A, we have to handle, address an obsolescence plan. Software doesn't become obsolete because we keep a copy of the compiler, linker, development tools, but hardware can. Can we, 30 years from now, still obtain that particular device, okay? That manufacturing tool. So I need to have a plan to show that I am thinking about not what I do today, but what the people who follow me do in 29 years. What's their plan? Single event upsets, really key. Years ago when our company was asked to have 60 engineers contribute to the Iridium satellite system, high altitude, single event upsets, really important. So we had to have an entire SAU mitigation strategy. Well, aircraft fly increasingly at high altitude. Military has a harsh environment. So what's our plan to provably assess SEUs. How can we really show that we have monitoring, prevention, air detection, correction, memory management unit to show that we've thought about it and tested so we know where the failures are, what the failure rates could be, and what are the additional derived safety requirements for SEUs. And then finally, derived requirements. Think about it. Regular requirements are assessed with transition criteria. They have parent requirements, there's guidelines, there's a checklist, there's a standard. So we verify the lower level requirements in the context of the higher level parent. But derived requirements quite often usually do not have a parent. How can they then be assessed in the context of the parent? Well, they can't. So there's a potential safety impact. Where there's a potential safety impact, that's a failure effect, that's a failure mode. So we have to provably, proof, standard, receipt, checklist, prove that a safety engineer assessed the derived requirement for safety. Now remember, software has verification, not validation, okay? Verification, does implementation meet requirement? Validation, do I have the right requirements? Correct, complete, unambiguous. Validation requires the system and the hardware. So to ensure completeness, correctness. Well, software doesn't have that, but the system and hardware do. Software needs the hardware. Hardware doesn't need the software. Interesting for validation. So 
derived requirements have to be reviewed, which is a safety function. We have to show we did it. So these are all important aspects of hardware that need to be addressed at the aircraft system avionics level. AMC 2152, watch for it, it's coming out. Now, next one, weak requirements. Remember, 178, 1980, Brooks, 75, Mythical Man Month, the number one cause of defects is assumptions. How do we then minimize assumptions to minimize defects? Easy, reduce the team size, then it's humans that make assumptions, then have better requirements. Consistently, most people think that requirements are the number one cause of defects. Most of you have shipped a product, you thought it was successful, you gave it to the customer. Most people say most of their requirements documents are incomplete. We agree. When we audit, a lot of our training is about how to develop better requirements, more detailed, how to do it efficiently. But let's look at requirements because they're all too weak out there. We will fail. This is what our requirement ecosystem looks like. At the top, we have customer requirements, features. We have system requirements that meet the criteria of ARP 4754A. And if you need more details, we don't have time. We've only got another 20 minutes of failure coverage here in this webinar. Download for free one of our papers on ARP 4754A. Just go to our website, fusion.com. Safety requirements. You're sitting in a room right now. Look at the ceiling. Do you have a smoke detector, a fire extinguisher, maybe a water supply to spray water on the fire? Those are not functional requirements, they're safety requirements. Yes, they perform a function, but the function is about safety of the room, not normal operating condition of the room. The room doesn't need the fire extinguisher. It's needed for safety. So those safety requirements have to be addressed for aviation aircraft, it's redundancy partitioning, isolation, better mean time between failure, MTBF on components, okay? It's health monitoring, it's built-in test at power up, it's switch over, continuous background. Then there's regulatory requirements. These all feed in through the systems engineering process of ARP 4754A to software or hardware. Software 178 has high-level requirements, then low-level requirements, then design. 254 hardware has hardware requirements, conceptual design, detail design. In aviation, the number three is special. It's strong. Think of tripods. Think of Roman architecture. Okay? So with three, it's strong. Software has three steps. Hardware has three steps. That's the requirement ecosystem. Now let's see where the failures are. This is okay. There's nothing wrong with this. This is a traditional engineering sequence. You write requirements, then you review them. You make the design, then you review it. You write the code and logic, then you review it. You write test cases based on requirements, not by looking at the implementation. If you look at the implementation first, that's executing the requirement, not testing it. A priori, Latin, in advance, what's the expected result of the requirement? Then execute test cases, review the results. Folks, this sequence often produces failures. Look at this. Requirements need to be reviewed. The best way to review the requirement is by writing the test procedure before you implement or design. That way the tester can say, is this requirement complete? Correct unambiguous. It's a validation of the requirements or a verification review in software. And then we improve the requirements, go back, clarify, fix them, and then develop the design. So what we do is write the test procedures before the design. That's the best way to prevent the weak requirement failure. Okay. Now, another failure mode we have in aviation is Weak engineering processes, we say ill-defined. Aviation engineering requires very strongly defined processes. Not a recipe of how you do it, but what you do. 
so that John and Mary, James and Susan, can develop consistently. The idea is to remove the ego, okay, the id in what's I'd say it's egoist, the person who thinks about himself and writes unique implementation requirements. No, no, we want consistency. So we must have a defined process that assesses the compliance of safety systems, high level, low level, design, implementation. We call that the transition criteria. Engineers have to show they followed the transition criteria, but process assurance, quality assurance, they're the ones who assess it. Now, increasingly at Fusion, we do training on agile and improved processes. We like agile, but not hacking agile. Agile has a capital A for a reason. There's a formality. So a parallel process, you have to have it. The pure waterfall simply takes too long. Today's market pressure, your schedule, you don't have enough time. So we like agile, but partial agile. It must be defined with those transition criteria, okay? Let's take a look. This next slide is our opinion, a Fusion's opinion, of what an optimal aviation sequence looks like, okay? And again, we'll send you the link to this recording. You can uh, use this. We do a lot of seminars worldwide and we always see our slides being reused. Just leave the copy right there. But in your upper left, there's the safety assessment requirements, 4761. Do you have safe requirements, the safety aspects, design, redundancy, based on the criticality level? Then you start the quality assurance process, which must be complete before the systems process. So we have a confirmed system process. Then 4754, the system process. We use that to define the system requirements. Then we develop our system plans. There's eight planning topics. Hardware, five. Software, five. And then standards, software, three. Remember? Requirements, design, code. Hardware, four. Requirements, development, VNV, and archiving. Then the checklist. Checklist for everything the engineers do, which means every box on the green snake. And you know why this snake, that's what this is. Top planning process, bottom, implementation, left to right, right to left. It's green. If we don't follow it, we spend too much money. We have to have traceability before we implement the software hardware system. Traceability of the safety assessment to the system requirements, to the allocated software hardware requirements. Then we implement CM right here, and that captures all the documentation. We then have our first SOI, and the SOI is interesting. The SOI is the stage of involvement. It's not PDR, CDR, okay? It's not TRR, SSR. They're a little unique. We'll talk about those in just a minute. Then we're ready to implement. After SOI 1, our planning's done. We have, in the case of software for this slide, high-level requirements, overlapping with low-level requirements, overlapping with design. Then coding, logic. Then SOI 2, did the code meet the design, the requirements according to the plans and standards? Then V and V for hardware systems, verification for everything. We have SOI 3, is the verification complete? Now, if you had no changes, kept everything up to date, you're done. But you always have changes. Changes are the number one cause of defects. So changes are really important. With the change, we have to ensure, was everything updated? Does it conform? So SOI 4, synonymous with the conformity review. After SOI 4, we can go flight testing, not before. We have to know, is it a safe flight? What are the mitigations for any open problem report? Folks, we can fly with open problem reports, but we have to know, is there a safety impact, safety engineer review? What is that impact? How do we then go? Okay, so that's our key process that we're following. Now, let's take a look at SOIs. Remember, SOI is stage of involvement. SOI 1, are the plans complete? The next day, are we ready to develop? 
SOI 2 is the implementation requirements design code logic complete to the plan standards and parents. SOI 3 V and V verification validation. SOI 4 conformity. Okay, so what do we focus on? Well, the documentation isn't clear. SOI used to be codified. The FAA EASA gave us the job aids, but those were taken down because you and us were using them as checklists. That was not the intent. So they're no longer available. We can send you a copy if you want, the, the old ones. But SOI 1, the key focus areas that we see failures on when we do gap analysis or audits or certification reviews of our clients is the safety assessment. The safety assessment wasn't formally reviewed. SOI 1 should look at the system requirements and the safety, pull threads, sample them. It should look at the COTS products. Increasingly, we use COTS. What components do we use? What are the reuse aspects? They're hardware. Do we meet AMC 2152A as I described 30 minutes ago? And then what about the technology? Okay, what about proposed alternate means of compliance? Then SOI 2, let's look at the requirements traceability, HLR, high level requirements, up to the safety and system. Then let's look at low level requirements. What kind of detail do we have? Is it sufficient so that two different developers could avoid assumptions? Do I have checklists for requirements, design, code, test, integration? Do I have instructions for completing the checklist objectively? Do they cover all of the plan and standard criteria? That's what I'm checking for SOA2. Did I use those checklists? Not just the pretty checklists you bought from a Fusion. No, no, no. Checklists are like exercise equipment. You have to buy the right exercise equipment, but then you have to use it. Buying it, the easy part. Using it, that takes a little sweat and work. Same thing here. Then we have the CM process. Okay, pardon me. We have the CM process, which includes configuration management re-review. Did I re-review all the potential side effects? Was quality involved? SOI 3, after the implementation is done, my focus is on structural coverage for Dal C and above. Did I meet requirements using requirements-based tests? Have I addressed architecture and the coupling, data flow, control flow coupling? And if you need information on that, look on the LinkedIn group, the uh, DO178C for engineers and managers. That's a group on LinkedIn. I think it's about 7,000 people in that. That has a good thread in there. Technical discussion on all the details of data flow control flow coupling. That's a big weak area that's often forgotten at SOI3. Then robustness testing. Remember, robustness testing is not functional testing. Robustness testing is rainy day. Can you break it? Environmental testing, shake it, bake it, try to break it, plus EMF, RF, RF, lightning, everything. Well, it's a little different here with robustness testing. Air values, illegal values, boundary values. Did you really cover all of the aspects of invalid transitions by looking at first the requirements and then the low level implementation? Then defect metrics. Now, this is optional, okay? But you should want to know what your defect metrics really are, okay? By doing that, you can assess how many errors did you have at the requirements process, design, implementation, testing. Who was making the errors? Were there any updates when you made errors? How many defects did you have? Oh, we had no defects. Well, that's not a good thing. That probably means you weren't tracking those defects. So take a look at metrics. Then SOI4, SOI4 is really interesting. It's about test coverage on changes, regression testing. Using a sample problem report thread, okay? Look at problem reports. We like problem reports because that shows we have a process to handle them. When you made a change, did you check for unwarranted changes? Did you update the requirement, the design? Was it a safety requirement? Was safety involved according to 4761, 4754A? Did you update the test? Did you do regression tests? The best regression test is a fully automated test. Then do you have evidence of changes? Problem reports, change control board, approval, 
which problem reports are still open? What's the potential safety effect of those open problem reports? Okay, next one. And we're almost done in a few minutes. I see the questions coming in. Gosh, there's, oh, 28 questions so far. Wow, you're going to keep us busy. We won't have time for all, but we'll take them in the order they received. This is the 4754A view. In your upper left, you've got the planning. You really have to follow this process. There's eight planning topics summarized here. Safety assessment, DAL assignment. How do you capture requirements? How do you manage them, including validation? How do you perform configuration management process assurance and the certification planning and coordination? So those integral processes need to be covered by the plans. And then on your left on the bottom, you've got a concept. Now this is different for Boeing, Embraer, uh, Airbus. Many of you are working eVTOL, urban mobility. What's the concept of your operation? Then have you defined all of the aircraft functions? Have you allocated those aircraft functions to systems according to paragraph 4.3, section 4.3 of 4754A? And then did you develop the system architecture allocating requirements to the item? Item is hardware 254, software 178. Did you implement the system and then documentation along with continuous implementation verification? This is the ecosystem. Now, there's no guidance for exactly how you do this, but you have to have plans for each box on this diagram. Those plans have to comply with 4754A. If you don't have that, then you're violating the Civil Aviation Guidelines, USA CFR 14, Code of Federal Regulations, right? You really have to do this. You can use an equivalent process, but trust me, there isn't an equivalent process to 4754. IEEE, Defense Standards, IEC, they're a subset or different, there's gaps. Best choice, use this one. Now, what's the difference with 4754A and the previous version of 4754? This is really important. The new version is now mandatory, and by the way, most of you on aviation, even in Europe, are using the 4754A for military, traditionally, Europe used defense standards on the military, European standards, but because of commonality, suppliers, Rockwell, Honeywell, Talus, Leonardo, that are doing both commercial and civil, there's a growth of 4754A everywhere. 4754A has tighter cohesion with the safety process, okay? And the hardware software process. There's an increased focus on the aircraft development assurance. Now, we also changed development assurance to item development assurance. The system DAL, the FDAL, functional DAL, could be different than the item DAL, item, hardware, software, component. There's also greater clarity and consistency of terminology and a near mandatory requirement to apply it, okay? Remember, when we evolve from 4754 to 54A, the idea was to incorporate lessons learned. We're always doing RCA, root cause analysis, to assess. If we don't understand the root cause, how could we do the analysis? Bring systems engineering and hardware software engineers together. Okay, remember, hardware software engineers are often sitting in cubicles two meters apart. That's six and a half feet for you American British folks. Well, they're sending each other email. We have to show we have a formal communication process and let's do that with 54A. Let's improve the formality and the rigor of assigning the DAO. Let's improve the integration with the safety process, 4764, 178, 254, and improve the integration with system and software hardware. That's how we evolve, okay? So if we don't do these things, we're setting ourselves up for failure. Got it? Now, here's the answer to the quiz. Wow, 50 minutes ago, you took the quiz. They're all false. Folks, 178254 ARPs, they're not optional for civil, they're required. And increasingly, they're required for military as well, worldwide. They don't, number two, provide clear instructions for engineering. 
They're a framework, okay? It's a framework. So what is that framework all about? Well, it's the rules, the objectives. So we have to uh, apply them. Now, number four, testing is not used to directly improve aircraft and system quality. Testing is used to assess the quality. Testing does not directly improve quality. If it did, we could simply continuously test and improve the quality, but we can't, okay? The way we improve is by improving the processes, the standards, the requirements. So testing assesses the degree of compliance. Proper process feedback loops can then possibly improve the quality. Number five, QA and PA, process assurance, perform detailed reviews and tests. No, they don't. You do, the engineers do. PA, QA, they assess your processes. Input, output, did you use the transition criteria? So those are the keys, okay? Folks, you made it. Those are the top failures in aviation. Well, let's take time for some Q&A, but before we do that, if you are interested in attending the world's largest aviation conference, it's in Europe, 1,500 people this year, Toulouse, March 18, 19, will be there. Great exhibits, hundreds of companies, 1,500 engineers, lots of free technical presentations, half a dozen tutorials that are half a day. Be there. Toulouse is a great place. Now, remember, if you want additional information, just look at our website. We'll download those. Okay, let's go ahead and start to dive in on the questions. Let's see, what do we have? Number one, is safety mandatory? That's a great question. You know, yes it is, and you have to prove you did it. The safety has to be compliant with 4761 and 4754. It's a framework of the functional hazard assessment at the aircraft and the system level. That's top down. Then there's the preliminary aircraft safety assessment, PASA, or the preliminary system safety assessment. That's the PSSA. That's architecture, also top down. Do you have redundancy, partitioning, reconfiguration, uh, built in test, power up, switch over, health monitoring? And then it's bottom to top after implementation. The system safety assessment, SSA, including the CCA, common cause analysis, zonal safety assessment, particular risk assessment, the FEMIA, failure mode effect analysis, the FMES, failure mode effect summary, those are bottom up for the functional failure path. So top down, bottom up, combined it's a closed loop. It is mandatory and you're supposed to use a compliant process to 4754, 4761, but there isn't one except those, so just use that, okay? Hope that answers your question. Um, when is the new DO254 coming? Oh boy, that's a great question. We've been getting this one for 15 years, right? It's not anytime soon. It's gonna be years on us. So instead, that's why we have CAST 27, Certification Authorities Software, uh, Certification Software Team, memo number 27, AC2152, EASA, SWCEHCM001. Uh, the new AMC 2152A is going to replace those, and that'll be the harmonization that clarifies DO254 according to those topics that I presented uh, earlier, okay? You can go back on the slide a few slides ago and, and look at those. The next one, well, that's a good one. What are the key differences with 178C and 178B? Good question. 178B was a big change over 178A. Uh, transition criteria, integrated testing, let's focus on components, uh, inclusion of safety, feedback. But 178C is a minor change. The, the changes happened with the supplements. There's four supplements. DO330 for tools, 331 for models, 332 for object-oriented technology, and 333 for formal methods, mathematical proofs of formal uh, models that replace the verification assessment activities. Well, 178 sees a small change 
it was mostly about clarifying the low-level requirements, uh, assessing the data flow control flow, ensuring that true robustness testing was really done, that test cases for structural coverage were added based on requirements, not just executing tests. So fairly minor, but those are the key uh, changes there. Okay. Oh, goodness, we've got another 35 questions. And folks, we're out of time. I want to thank you for coming. If you don't get an email in the next day or two with a link to this recording, then send an email to uh, info to fusion.com. We'll figure out what happened. But this should you should be having an uh, email link so you can watch this recording and pass it along to your coworkers who weren't able to register because we were oversubscribed. So, folks, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, wherever you are. Thanks for tuning in. Hope to see you at... Uh, well, how about Toulouse in two months? Cheers. Bye-bye.